So we do something a little different this morning. We're going to start by reciting the Lord's Prayer. And I, by that I mean the more, the more traditional version, but with modernised words, more in line with the one that, the book in Matthew uh, than the one that we read earlier in Luke a few, you know, several months ago when we were in, in that part of the Bible. So we'll just read all this through together. Let's read it, shall we? Our Father, please read it, who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, a lot of us can just do that without thinking, um, especially those who are a bit older, because we used to have it in school in the, in the old days. Even I'm old enough to have, it in, to have had it in school a little bit, you know, public school. But times have changed, haven't they? But many of us can say it from memory, but I, I did that so I could draw our attention to one spe- special phrase in there, and if you're paying attention, I'm, which Linus has made it very clear, what the phrase is. Your kingdom come, right? Because that's the title of the message today. Because how often do we really consider what we're praying for when we say these words? Because, you know, the Lord's Prayer, we just tend to recite it sometimes and we just don't get our heart involved sometimes. And do we, you know, and do we even tie them to the following line there either, which is really, really goes right with it there. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it will mean to have Jesus' kingdom come, right? I think, to have his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're longing for. So it's interesting, it's God's, you know, God's timing that this passage is the one we're looking at after last week's sermon about how Jesus is going to fix our broken world. What we just read describes for us a bit of what that really means you know, and, and how it will all go down. So to see what Jesus is really getting at in this passage, I'm going to set the scene by taking us on a bit of a treasure hunt through the Bible. Because the context here does lead us to some bits of the Bible that are related to this, and we're sort of going to follow a bit of a rabbit trail. So it'll take us through some of the less travelled areas of the Christian faith. Because, you know, let's face it, this is, anytime this topic comes up, it's controversial. So people tend to avoid it. But I'm not like that. We... We're going through this as it is in the Bible. And so we're going to go through some areas we haven't seen too often and we might peek behind the curtain a little bit to see some of the spiritual warfare that goes on behind the scenes of our world. And I have to warn you, it's a bit of a tricky passage to understand properly, so everything I say today is as best I can tell at this personal point in my life. And um, so that's my little caveat there. So in that spirit, we're going to begin at the end, at the end of the passage today, I mean. So that's where we find Jesus talking about a feast for birds. And the word would be eagle or vulture, but the context would probably suggest more a vulture since there's a fair bit of scavenging going on, that's the idea. And eagles don't really scavenge, they tend to swoop down and catch their own prey. Now I'll apologise in advance if you're a bit squeamish with gory stuff. But I'll try to keep that as much of a minimum as possible too. And uh, there's not too many kids in here anyway. But we need to face up to that fact, don't we? That we can't escape it when we read the Bible as a whole. It gets a little bit gory sometimes. But it's necessary if Jesus is going to clean up the mess that we made, right? Because it's, it's our fault, ultimately. So verse 37 of Luke 17. So we read about a body there, which is probably just using the singular body to represent all the fallen bodies in Jesus' return, or at Jesus' return. It's just the way he's using it there. And the body attracts scavenging birds. The body's plural, really, idea. So now is there anywhere in the Bible that talks about that kind of thing? Yes. And as I said, that um, there are quite a few. And Revelation 19 is one place. But I'm actually going to take us to Ezekiel 39, because that's one that gives us some more useful, useful extra info that we're going to work from. So Ezekiel 39, if you have your Bible you can turn there, but I will bring it up on the screen too. Verse 18, God is speaking 
to the birds and the wild animals after the destruction of the armies of Gog who comes against Israel in the last days. And he says this, verse 18, You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of he goats, of bulls, all of them fat beasts of Bashan. Now just so you know, there are many scholars who don't put this event at the same time as the second coming of Jesus. Um, there are plenty who do, but some who don't. So um, just so you know that, but it will become obvious sh- shortly why I personally do suspect they are together. But I just want to be up front that there's legitimate debate here. So um, anyway, the point I want to draw from this is that there are the ones killed, the ones who are killed are called mighty and princes of the earth. You see there in Ezekiel 39.18. So these are clearly ones in some sort of authority position. But notice how Ezekiel then describes them as rams, lambs, he goats, bulls, and all from Bashan. So are they all somehow animals from that area? Bashan, it's northern Israel, very, very north. No, but... The reason I think they're described that way is very informative to us. Now, if you're really perceptive and you were here, uh, you might recall the last time I mentioned Bashan. Anyone? Who's got really good memory? In the Psalm series? Yeah, Psalm 22. And I remember Psalm 22, it reads a bit like the description of Jesus suffering on the cross, the first half or so anyway. And part of that suffering is described like this, Psalm 22, verse 12. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Do you remember that bit, for those who are here? And we saw back then it was very likely a reference to the spiritual entity, so you know, demons and fallen angels and so forth, who are working through the human agents to crucify Jesus. And the link to Bashan is important because that's the region which was well known in that day as a place of evil and spiritual darkness, Generally speaking, it had you know, connections with Mount Hermon, and, which is in that area, like I said, in the far north of modern-day Israel, and all the evil things that went on there, which I don't have time to explain now. But the point is that the mention of Bashan and all these animals in Ezekiel 39 would take the original readers straight to these themes, okay? so all these spiritual entities and stuff, because the spiritual world was always quite near the front of ancient Jewish thinking, because that's just how they were brought up. And I think it's actually something we really lack in our spiritually insulated Western culture because um, I think we can miss things like this because we just don't think spiritually like they do, or they did. Uh, They probably don't quite think so spiritually nowadays, but back then they did. I'm talking about um, Israel, people in Israel. So it seems Ezekiel was describing the defeat of spiritual entities who have apparently taken on human flesh, as we often see you know, Bible, in the Bible, demons can and do possess people. But it means they, the demons, can die. And this is exactly what God declared for them a long time ago. And we read about that in Psalm 82. Now, Psalm covers all, Psalms cover all kinds of different things. And this is a very niche market, you could say. So, yeah, Psalm 82. I did warn you it was a bit of a treasure hunt, so we're going through a few things. But remember, I'm just trying to set the scene for us to understand the Luke passage today. That's where we're going with all this. So Psalm 82, it's interesting. It's in the context of the court of God, like a big courtroom scene. And that's the one true God with a capital G, God as we know him. He pronounces judgment on the fallen beings who aspire to be gods. That's, we write a small g, gods. Okay. And they try and claim that. And verse 1 makes that clear. So Psalm 82, verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council as the the judge. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So it actually literally says God's there, Elohim. Then the true God questions them on the misuse of their power to influence the people of the world for evil. And so because of that abuse of authority, if you read through Psalm 82, that's what it's talking about. Here's God's verdict, and we'll go to verse 6. I said, you are gods, son of the most high, all of you. And son of the most, I mean, they were directly created by God. They weren't born like humans. Verse 7. Nevertheless, even though that you're, you weren't born like humans, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. 
Now, many say it's simply using the word gods to refer to human kings there and God's judgment on the human kings. But if that were true, what kind of judgment would it be for them to die like men? You know, what, what would you need to, the like men there if they were human anyway? So that's what I believe is the sentence on these false gods, be they demons or angels or whatever the case may be. And how is that going to happen? God the Father tells us in the next verse, which closes the psalm, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So obviously with our New Testament glasses that we have the privilege of having now, we know that God there is who? Which member of the Trinity? Jesus, yes. God the Son. So he's coming to do this one day. He won't just sort out the human agents of evil on the earth, but also the spirits that empower and direct them as well. And that is the reality of what's happening. You know, There's spiritual powers behind those in, in authority very often. Now, I know some of you today might think this is a bit left-field stuff, but hopefully once we put this all back in context of what Jesus tells us in the last part of Luke 17, it will start to click a little bit. So the Bible always has surprises for us, doesn't it? It um, challenges our w- way of thinking very often. And that's good. That's what it's meant for. But remember, we pray your kingdom come, so we'd better get some idea of what we're asking for. That's what we're doing. And so with that background now, well, let's turn to the passage for today where we find the Pharisees really pressing Jesus. And we can probably picture this scene as one where the Pharisees are, you know, who are like the pastors of the Jewish religious system, they're basically sneering at Jesus for his preaching about the kingdom. It's like they're saying, they, you talk about bringing the kingdom, well, why don't you get on with it, Jesus? You know, you're just all hot air. I don't think you have what it takes. Bring this kingdom. So just think about that as we read through from verse 20 of Luke 17 now. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, so the word asked is very strong like demand, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So in other words, Jesus is saying, hey, your attacks on me make no difference to God's timetable. That's what I'm working to, he says. And besides, the kingdom isn't visible at this point. It's hidden from the world until the time comes to make it obvious. End quote. Even though it's not a quote, it's a creation. But it, that's the point I'm trying to make there. So that's what Jesus is really saying there, I think. And now I'd better explain here the two main ways to take that statement, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you too. The final phrase is literally within you. So the kingdom of God is within you. Which can mean either amongst you, like as a collective, or actually inside each of you. Okay? Or many of you at least, or whatever. But inside you is the point there now this esv translation takes it as the first meaning so amongst you and implies that jesus is referring to himself as the representative and and king of the coming kingdom he's standing there saying basically i'm here i'm i'm the kingdom and the main reason they say that is that they rightly say that jesus wouldn't ever say the kingdom is within the pharisees themselves but after much consideration i lean towards the idea that he does actually mean inside you as a hidden thing, since that fits far better with the context of verses 21 to 24. And as for saying the kingdom is within you to Pharisees, I would then simply argue that Jesus is meaning that that you in the very general sense, that as an overall thing, the kingdom of God is inside people, who of course we know from other places are people who believe. That's who the kingdom is in. So I would say he's using the word you there, like the way... Imagine if your friend might uh, tell you about someone else doing something wrong and they sum it up by saying, you can't do that. That kind of you in the sense that it sort of represents anyone. It's not you personally. He's not telling you not to do that. But specifically, but he's just saying you can't do that as a generalisation. So perhaps that's how you is being used there. That sounds double dutch, doesn't it? So anyway, the... Part of the reason I think Jesus is talking about the hidden nature of the kingdom is, is that's, that's why he's using that that way. For this, it's this phase of the plan, it's hidden. So the practical aspect for, for us 
uh, is this, uh, when we see people who claim to be Jesus, this is what he's trying to warn us for, or even those who just promote some special hidden knowledge that they, only they possess, you know, that's always a warning sign. So both of those things can, we can safely discount as not from God. Jesus coming to set up his visible kingdom will not be secret. And we'll read more about that in a second. But first, verse 22, where we note that Jesus now turns to his disciples specifically. So he was talking to the Pharisees just then. He turns to his disciples and teach, to teach some stuff that will be important for believers to know. Not the unbelievers like the average Pharisee. Verse 22. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there and look here. Do not go out or follow them. So there we have the setup and the potential deception in that little bit there. So the setup is that believers are rightly longing for the kingdom to be revealed. I think many of us are here feel that way. We're longing for the kingdom to be revealed and that's a good longing to have. For Jesus to come and sort out the mess like we talked about last week. And the worse things get, the more we desire it. Is that right? That's how I feel. But verse 23 here tells us that it will take a while, so we need patience. But if we lack patience, we may, may be open to the kind of deception that preys on our longing. So that of false Christ. So we might jump on anything and say, oh, that's Christ, you know. So if someone is telling us we need to go to some certain place to find Jesus, what's the instruction from Jesus himself here? Don't do it. Don't go out and follow them. That's Jesus' words right there. For instance, there's more and more talk today about thin places where some claim you can more easily access God because the distance between heaven and earth is somehow less. I don't know if you've heard that kind of phrase recently. It's, um, it's, it's certainly getting into the church more and I think it's unwise. But firstly, didn't Jesus say we worship in spirit and truth, right? Remember that to the women at the well? Yep. And the location is not the issue anymore. So we can worship God anywhere. And secondly, the problem is this idea of thin places is another one from the, these new age concepts, which is, like I said, seeped into the, into the church from the ancient mystics. So I'll tell you, it's a trap. Don't think you have to go to some thin place. It doesn't exist. Ignore it and just keep looking right up where you are, okay? God placed you where you are. Let's go from there. So... Now, why? Because the coming of the kingdom will be known instantly worldwide. 24. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So the question very often arises, so is this the rapture of the church or the second coming? At least among um, premillennialists anyway. Now, I realise some put them together, but for many reasons I don't. Um, but rather than get into all that today, I'll just be up front and say, I don't think the rapture actually comes up anywhere in this passage. Even at the end when everyone assumes that's what I was talking about. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we need to keep in mind the context here. So this all began, remember, with the Pharisees asking about the coming of the kingdom of God. And while the rapture can in some ways be seen to be connected with that, it would seem also that the most natural understanding, taking into account everything Jesus says here in this passage, is that Jesus is talking about his return at the end of the tribulation period. So the still future, most terrifying time the earth will see. And I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus comes to earth in person at the end of that. That's my personal belief there. That's what the Bible teaches. So. But there is a lot that has to happen between the time Jesus speaks these words, so back 2,000 years ago nearly, to his disciples and that day, which is still future. So Jesus points them to the next main thing on the agenda from their perspective. And that's Jesus' imminent crucifixion, verse 25. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, Jesus has warned his disciples once before in Luke that he will die at some point. Uh, but this is possibly only a few weeks or perhaps even less, um, from, from it actually happening, his crucifixion now. So Jesus is really trying to get them ready that things are about to change. And how many times do we miss the cues that God sends us in our lives? 
we need to make sure we're spending time in, with him in prayer and then reading the Bible so we'll be receptive as possible to the prompting, promptings in our lives too because Jesus was very open, I'm going to die and that just didn't compute in their brain so we can be like that can't we just, so we've got to keep listening Okay, well, that comment on his crucifixion was kind of by the way. It was in brackets, if you like. So he gets back to his point about the second coming again in verses 26 to 27. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, we can look at this in the straightforward way or in a way that's a bit more provocative. So first, a straightforward way. The people in Noah's day were just you know, living their lives, enjoying their own pleasure, but they were blissfully unaware of the danger that was about to hit. Not because they didn't have the opportunity to know, because Noah had been preaching to them for over 100 years, and this big boat going up there, and then, what's this all about? You know, plenty of chance to talk about it. But no, they were willfully dismissive of the flood about to come. And so it may be that Jesus was simply making that point, you know, that when he's about to return, the vast majority of folks will be just like that. Just, he's not coming, don't worry about it. And this interpretation is one major reason why many people tie this to the rapture, if they're pre-tribulation rapture believers like I am. Uh, but it's, if that's the line you take, then life will be business as usual right up until the rapture happens, and that's true. Uh, then all Christians will are taken to heaven and chaos breaks out on the earth. Now I believe that will happen, so I'm not knocking it. I'm just not sure that this is passage is saying that. Um, and I'll explain that as I go. Because as I said before, I believe this is all about the second coming, after the rapture and the tribulation, in the way I understand the Bible. But the problem there is that this will not be business as usual during the tribulation, certainly not by the end of it. People will be struggling to stay alive, and many won't. It'll, it'll be that bad. But I suspect the answer to that is in who is involved in the festivities. And to give you a picture of where I'm going with this, have you noticed in recent years there seems to be an increasing distinction between the ones with the power and the rest of us in society? Generally speaking, if you happen to have made it in business, or Hollywood certainly, Music or politics or the media or sport or, you know, pick a, something that make, anything that makes you famous, you tend to become part of the elite. Anyone notice that tendency? Yeah? Now, there are some notable exceptions to that, but the, the strong trend is that in places where God has been or is being shoved aside, there are smaller groups of powerful elites who call the shots, where the majority are increasingly ignored and stripped of power certainly in democracies. Yeah. You think Brexit, anyone? <laughs> or am I not allowed to say that? Sorry, I'll move on. Um, because it's not just India or wherever where you, where you have all this hierarchy with the elites at the top. It's spreading all over. Well, if Jesus is referring to that kind of elite class ruling in those statements, um, perhaps that fits here. And I think it does in, in Luke 17 there, since the ruling elite in that case that he's talking there is the Pharisees, the bosses, they were specifically right there listening to this, remember, because at the start they, he turned from the Pharisees and he went to the, to the disciples and the Pharisees would have still been there. Because if this is referring to the tribulation period, the elites will be the only ones who are doing the marrying and the festive feasting and all that uh, and doing whatever they want, right? They're the only ones who will be doing that, the rest will be suffering. So they'll be having a grand old time at the expense of everyone else. And as it happens, they will be the ones who are most influenced by the evil spiritual powers we talked about before. So remember how Psalm 22 described the entities behind the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders as bulls and lions and so forth? Symbols for evil beings. So again, this fits there. So because oppression and tyrannical class structures are always hallmarks of Satan's work. And so the link to Noah there is significant then. And this is the other way of looking at it. Since the reason for the flood, if you read all of Genesis 6, 
was primarily sins of the sons of God. It says there in Genesis 6 verse 2. And the sons of God used in this way always refers to angels and those who have been directly created by God not born. Now, there's a whole story there, but we're not going to go there. We're going to stay on track. But just saying the context fits again. The point is, I think we need to read this as part of God's fulfillment of his promise in Psalm 82. So his judgment on the spiritual beings, the gods who rebelled against him. And further evidence of that is in the next illustration Jesus gives, which is in verses 28 to 30. So we're still Luke 17 here. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So again, we have that picture of ignorant indulgence, you know, right up to the time they're destroyed. And I suspect there were all kinds of perversions to God's design going on too in, um, in Sodom and Gomorrah. But notice the mercy of God to the faithful in both of these illustrations. It's because we've got believing Noah, right? And believing Lot. Sometimes it's hard to believe that Lot was a believer, but we affirm that in the New Testament that he was, he was righteous. So they were both rescued out of harm's way before judgment came, weren't they? Okay. Noah was in the ark and Lot was taken out with his family. But why? Why were they taken out? Because God doesn't have any judgment left for his children. Because we accept Christ's payment on our behalf, don't we? So we don't get judged. So as we read in the story of Lot back in Genesis 19, that the angels couldn't bring the judgment until Lot and his family were out the way, actually. It specifically says that. He had to get them out the way before they could do anything. But once they were gone, then, boom, destruction comes. So that should be a reminder to us now that we are very clear that judgment is coming on the earth, how can we avoid it? To be with Jesus, right? Be with Jesus, then you're on the right side. Be with the judge. And we do that by trusting him with our lives now, today. So, back to Jesus' kind of scary sermon here. And for this bit, it seems he's speaking prophetically to anyone who's around at this time in history. So this bit coming up, verse 31. Sort of looking forward here. On that day, so he's put it forward there. Let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house, his goods in the house, not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. So I think the idea behind this advice is that once you know Jesus is returning, if you're anywhere near the ruling elites who are the main targets, get on your bike. Get out of there. If you're worried about the things of this world at that point, it shows that you have a completely skewed idea of what really matters in life. So remember Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is that right? Yeah. Well, think of it this way. Can you imagine the people outside the ark in Noah's flood, desperately trying to collect everything they can to hold on to before, and then they just get swept away anyway. So... That would be absolutely pointless, wouldn't it? Trying to hold on to these things when you're going to get washed away anyway. Or likewise with Lot and his family, don't let anything slow you down or distract you. Not like his wife, right? And Jesus warns the disciples there in verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. You can see her just there kind of turning around and looking. Now, For those who aren't so familiar with the story, you can read all about it in Genesis 18 and 19. But Lot's wife in particular became famous, or maybe I should say infamous, for hesitating and looking back um, when she was supposed to be fleeing. So the inference there is that she looked back longingly at the worldly life she was leaving behind. And the Bible tells, tells us she turned into a pillar of salt. So whether it's that she was burned up or covered in ash or whatever it is, we don't know. But we do know we shouldn't follow her example. Because we shouldn't be, be living for the things of the world, right? That's the problem that she was doing. So let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because he's our only hope. We mustn't try and put our roots down too far in this world because it's, it's destined to end. And Jesus continues, verse 33. 
Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Now, this is not to say we should try and die young or anything like that. That's not what it means. But uh, the idea behind this is really to be a living sacrifice rather than a dead one. See? You're a much better living sacrifice if you're alive, (laughs) of course. Because it only takes one moment of bravery or maybe foolishness to die for something. It's a whole other level of commitment to dedicate your life for something and be a living sacrifice. Do you see the difference there? You you can sacrifice quickly, but to be a living sacrifice is far more useful. Okay, as we head towards a close here, we're going to read Jesus' descriptions that seem awfully like the rapture. And I'm not not convinced that it is, but I'll explain that. Verse 34 and 35. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Now that does seem pretty much like the rapture. That's true. And if you're a post-trib rapture person, you go, yep, that's proof. The second coming and the rapture happen at the same time. However, this doesn't have to only be the rapture. Okay? The book of Revelation tells us about another event in the last days. In chapter 14, verse 19, for instance, and um, I'll just flick there, you don't need to go there. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So whether this is the same thing, I honestly don't know, but here we clearly have a gathering of sinners for judgment happening in the last days too. So it may well be that these things relate to what Jesus is describing in Luke 17 here, a a different kind of gathering, not, not of righteous but unrighteous, unbelievers. But we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Sometimes we can't have everything checked off, can we? Now, something to mention is that some manuscripts include an extra verse in Luke 17, and it caused a little bit of confusion for people this morning. We were trying to work out the Bible readings. Um, and if it's in your Bible, it's verse 36. I think it probably is in the King James. And it's a line that's in a similar passage in Matthew 24, uh, which is there about a bit two in the field. One is taken and the other left. That's what verse 36 says, if it's there. But whether you include that or not, uh, there is something interesting in these things. There are events that, in that time, were done at different times of the day. So it's something we don't really pick up so much in our culture because their sleeping is obviously at night, right? And grinding grain was something that the ladies did before breakfast, early in the morning, first thing, so they could make food for breakfast. And if you count the field work verse, that was something that happened through the daylight hours you're working in the field. So you have an event which the disciples knew was sudden, but you have it apparently happening at different times of the day. Now you might not have thought about this, but how does that work in your, if you're just in, mo- in one place all your life? You know, it, got, it confused them. Which, you know, for us and our awareness today, with the earth having time zones and, and all over the globe, it makes perfect sense. You know? But to the disciples in ancient Judea, this was a bit confusing and the kind of thing that would open them up to ridicule. You know how those anyone antagonistic to God would pick up stuff like this and say, ha, see, you've got no idea. These things happen at all different times of the day. And we get that kind of thing today, don't we? We get people attacking us for things they don't get. But there's always an answer. But whether we know it now or later, we just have to live with it, you know, sometimes. In their case, they didn't know. So um, what we can conclude from this, though, is that the second coming of Jesus will be a worldwide event. That's what we can tell from this because we know what the world was like. But since the disciples were confused, they asked this clarification question, verse 37. I always wondered what this question meant. And they said to him, Where, Lord? In other words, what kind of place exists where all these activities happen at the same time? It doesn't make sense. But as Jesus, Jesus often does, he answers cryptically. He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Well, thanks, Jesus. That helps a lot. So no, now that we've gone through the, what the rest of Jesus' teaching, I hope you can see how this statement at the end helps us to see that we're talking about the second coming of Jesus and that it will be a very turbulent time, to say the least, right? Especially for the ruling class at that time. 
So being empowered or even possessed by supernatural beings, they will have the great time enjoying the pleasures and spoils of being part of the in crowd. But we have news for them, don't we? It's not going to last very long. So every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. That's a reminder to us and to them that there is a day of reckoning on the horizon. And all of us need to be safely in the arms of Jesus if we're going to avoid the horrors of this day. So last week I talked about being comforted and challenged, right? And this is a bit of an example of that. It's a comfort that we know Jesus will take care of us if we trust him. And that he will one day fully deal with the sins in the world. That's a comfort too. We don't have to put up with sin forever. But it's also a challenge. There are lots of people on this planet who are yet to know Jesus for themselves. So let's help them get to know him, shall we? Because we don't want them to be part of the wrong side of this, do we? So that's the challenge for us. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for that comfort that you are coming, and that you love us and will protect us, and that you've dealt with our punishment already in your own body. But Lord, there's also the challenge there of so many who don't know you. Lord, we, we know your heart yearns for them, and we would love to have that passion too, Lord. And we do have that passion for many of those who we love. Help us, Lord, to be able to share your word with them with that confidence that you are coming and that you have done enough to save each and every one of us. So we praise you and thank you for this challenging passage, Lord, and may it change us in our hearts by your spirit working in us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.